Sean Moss, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, Jay. This is an important uh, show because I remember, uh, you know, Think Tank did an interview of um, the fellow who was the CEO of Oceanic Institute back uh, several years ago. He was the founder, I think. I don't remember his name. What was Tap Pryor? No, no, after Tap Pryor. He was a retired military officer. Tom Fairwell, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, right. This is probably 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Tom Fairwell, right. Yeah, and uh, I guess it was a farewell to Tom. Some <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. We've we've um, moved moved on since then. There's no doubt. So uh, you are the acting president and CEO of the scientific program over there. That's right. What does that mean? Well, uh, that, that there's a lot on the plate with that title. Um, I uh, as of about a year ago, I assumed uh, the, the some of the presidential responsibilities, the overall management of our private nonprofit organization and I retained uh, the responsibilities of, of oversight of the technical scientific program. So it's really an integration of some of the executive administrative pieces, not all of them, uh, but some of them, and then retaining oversight uh, and propagation of the technical programs. Hmm, okay, so uh, what's your scientific background that makes you like to do that? Well. Uh, I'm essentially a marine biologist by academic training. I, you know, I, I swear to God, I think most of the people I know are marine biologists. Really? Do you find that it's pro sort of proliferated as a, as a given uh, discipline? Um, you can run into them everywhere. They do everything, you know. They really? don't necessarily stick to marine biology. Well, they just jack of all trades, maybe. Well, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like going to law school. You know, you learn about the law, but then you can do anything. So marine biology, <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm not sure we cover all of this, those <laughs> skill sets, but I think I'm a victim of what I would call the Jacques Cousteau phenomenon. I grew up when Jacques Cousteau was uh, on TV quite often and I was enamored with the ocean and always had a marine aquarium in my house on the East Coast and uh, pursued uh, biology academically. Ended up here for graduate school at UH mm -hmm. in the zoology department mm -hmm. and uh, actually did my doctoral research at Oceanic Institute back in the mid 80s and uh, stayed with the organization. Under Tap Pryor? Not under Tap Pryor. Tap was there in the 60s, so yeah. OI's been around for 53 years. We were founded in one form or another in 1960 and have persevered the ebb and flow of uh, financial support and, uh, and all kinds of things. But we've got a wonderful, wonderful facility and organization out in, in Waimanalo. You know, it's so interesting that there were visionary, there have been visionary people in aquaculture and yes. marine biology over the years. Um, Dave uh, Carl. Dave Carl. At the university. Sure. Really, you know, he's in the National uh, Academy of Science. Right, right. Uh, an amazing academician, really. And, yes. And, and he made his bones on marine biology, um, as I recall. I'm right that, about that's that. That's right. He's a marine microbial ecologist. I actually worked in his lab as a graduate so student. I was right? fortunate well, to speak, spend time. With, with, with Dave. He's done some great things for the state of Hawaii and the, and the discipline of marine uh, biology and oceanography. So, so uh, Tap Pryor really had uh, a vision yes. about aquaculture in Hawaii. Yes. There was also a fellow by the name of Art Lowe, or Lau. Uh, it was spelled L-O-W-E. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a Chinese name. Um, but he, he had uh, aquaculture facilities on the North Shore for a while. And there have been others uh, in various places in the islands. And it's so interesting to study, you know, in the same 50 years you're talking about, mm -hmm. all the things that have happened, all the guys with all the vision. And here we are today, yeah. and Oceanic Institute is the survivor. It's still there, yeah. still doing its thing, still a, a sort of a global leader in its area. Right. And uh, in terms of an aquaculture industry, what shall I say? Not much. Not much. Not much. Not much. L lots of obstacles, impediments. Um, it's, in, it's interesting to think about the geography of, of Hawaii and how isolated we are. And that's an advantage uh, in certain contexts. And in other contexts, it's a disadvantage. Um, for some of the work we do at Oceanic Institute, the, the uh, remoteness of the Hawaiian Islands is an advantage from a biosecurity standpoint. We don't have to deal with the disease problems that plague uh, other places on the globe, um, particularly in Asia where disease epidemics occur all the time and they wipe out animals. By being as remote as we are, that gives us a competitive advantage, particularly in the shrimp broodstock industry. On the other hand, 
the requirement to have to import all of the inputs into aquaculture makes it cost prohibitive. Um, so the cost of importing things like feed um, and equipment and even sometimes labor makes commercial aquaculture in, in Hawaii very uh, cost inefficient. But it, it, check me on this because uh, I have you know spots of knowledge over the years that I've learned about Oceanic Institute and I want to sort of connect the dots with you. Um, for a long time, you were just doing research out there, right? It was right. all research, and then at some point in time, you got into the shrimp broodstock uh, uh, production, uh, you know, activity, <clears throat> and you had, <coughs> and you had some of the world's best, probably still today, the world's best shrimp broodstock out in, right out there in mm -hmm. uh, Waimanalo, uh, broodstock that uh, you know was a fifty dollars a fish. An animal, excuse me, yeah. uh, that you could sell to Thailand, for example, and right. they could use that in their fish farms in Thailand, and uh, and that would propagate a whole a whole generation right. of shrimp in in there. And and those shrimp that they propagated were considered very high quality because right. of the broodstock. Right. But the broodstock don't last very long, and right. you have to replenish the broodstock, right. and that's a sort of a, a a perennial job for you to replenish the broodstock. Right. Well. W the broodstock that we, we sold at OI, and we don't sell broodstock anymore, we got out of that because the broodstock were actually surplus from our research. Okay. We've always been and will continue to be a research organization. The excess broodstock we could either uh, have at a barbecue, um, but we found market value in them and we were, uh, we were selling them as research surplus and then the, the revenue generated from that went back into the research program. I the, feel guilty eating a $50 <laughs> shrimp. Yeah, they're quite know. good. Yeah, they're almost <laughs> worth eating. But what we were able to do with USDA funding was we created what we call SPF or specific pathogen-free brood stock. Yes. They're essentially disease-free brood stock. Yes. And there's real inherent value in that quality uh, globally in the global shrimp farming industry, which, by the way, is about a $15 billion a year industry. And it will increase. And it will increase, that's right. Um, so the, the SPF status of the brood stock, coupled with the selective breeding that we've been doing since 1995, where we've selectively bred the animals for enhanced growth and, and disease resistance, in addition to being disease free, our mm -hmm. strains are disease resistance. We spawned local companies here uh, in Hawaii that then really took on the commercial role of exporting the brood stock overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became uh, a multi-million dollar annual industry here, where Hawaii is known for, continues to be known for, the production and sale of SPF uh, genetically improved so if, shrimp. So if you're not, if you're producing only for research, but you're not selling, who is selling? There's several commercial companies still oh, really? in, in Hawaii. There's they one. get it from you, though. They, they got it, their original stock from us, and they subsequently developed their own breeding programs and expanded their genetic resources. So they no longer get any animals from, from OI. But, but initially, they did. That's how they formed their business, mm -hmm. by buying baby shrimp from us and growing them out to brood stock and then selling them to a third party in Asia. Asia has an incredible market for, for this shrimp. Because they can't do SPF. They, they're not, the water isn't clean enough. Well, they're, they're right. trying. Yeah. Um, and they're also producing uh, in-house, if you will, uh, generations of, of selectively bred animals. But there's, uh, there's an inherent problem with that. And it has to do with genetic diversity and the potential for inbreeding. So what we find, if, say, a Chinese company buys broodstock from Hawaii, an F, what we would call an F1 generation, and then propagate that using the small population they have within two or three generations, that population will have accumulated uh, in, inbreed, they would have been inbred. And when an animal becomes inbred, its fitness traits, its reproductive traits uh, are compromised. So ultimately, the client will, will see a significant decline in the performance of the of the offspring from those brood stock and will have to come back to the well to get a, a genetic replenishment if you will and the well would be one of these commercial companies right. in Hawaii that took over the business right don't you miss the business I mean it, was, it sounds like it was a nice cash flow um, we are oriented towards the science the the team of uh, people the technical team at OI are all academic biologists and what drives us is the passion for new discovery 
the research, uh, the technology development. The routine day-to-day -day commercial sale of a, of a product, whether it's a shrimp or a widget, it's not terribly appealing to us. We're scientists by passion, and the research is really what drives us. I'm, and that, I'm happy to hear that, yeah, actually, yeah. Sean. I mean, I think that is a better direction for you. You yeah. were originally organized for that and uh, well, we've never deviated from that that's the good news mm -hmm. we, we ended up selling research surplus um, primarily when we lost significant federal funding as a way to keep our door open mm -hmm. but all of the profits from the sale of broodstock went funneled right back into research mm -hmm. that's the core of who we are and will continue to be so mm -hmm. well that's great yeah yeah so now let's talk about your affiliations because uh, it was only what uh, five six seven years ago that HPU acquired mm -hmm. Oceanic Institute. What, what's that like? Well, in 2003, we formed an affiliation with Hawaii Pacific University. We were and continue to be a separate entity. We are our own private nonprofit organization. Um, the the relationship between OI and HPU is is couched in this affiliation context, and and. The manifestations of the affiliation include the presence of HPU marine science faculty uh, using some space at OI. We have graduate students there. Some of our staff teach uh, some courses at HPU. So that's really the, the context of the affiliation right now. We are in discussions with HPU about um, looking for a, a, a closer relationship. Yes, so um, are we. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to a closer relationship, um, in, including more students at, at, at OI help, helping with the research. Um, we think there's good mutual synergistic benefits to, to getting closer, but since 2003, 10 years ago, it's been uh, this, this affiliation of uh, really trying to exploit the potential synergies between the two organizations. Mm, well, that's great. I yeah. you know, I think HPU is a, is a really notable organization in town. and. And we do we do a lot with them. You yeah. know, some of their people come and host our shows. This table has seen many HPU sure, yeah. uh, hosts and also students in the communications department with yeah. Pete Britos and others, Carlos Suarez. Right, you know, sure, these guys. sure, sure. Um, so and and some of our staff who you've met, you know, are products of HPU. Sure. They came to us because of our affiliation with HPU. We're, no, it's a, it's a great organization. Yeah, and they have a, a top-notch marine science program with great faculty doing uh, a wide array of marine science research. Uh, they get some of the, uh, some really competitive, bright students there. In fact, I, I would venture to say that OI has hired uh, over, the, over the last 15 years or so, uh, uh, 15, 20 HPU students as full-time employees. I think we may be one of the lar OI may be one of the largest employers of marine science undergraduate students from HPU. The quality of students that come out from the marine science program are better than any in the state and on m many mainland universities. So they're very well prepared. Well, I want to talk to you about uh, exactly what kind of research you're doing, but before we get to that, I'd like to know about your initiative into China. What's what's happening there? Sure. Um, in in 2011, uh, the, uh, the the federal earmarks were cut that supported a lot of our research, and a lot of uh, small nonprofits took took a big hit uh, in operating capital, and and we did too. And we were fortunate in that. Um, during the time that we were receiving federal funding, we were able to develop technologies that had market value, global market value, including the shrimp brood stock. Um, and so what we found was that we were able to um, continue to do research overseas and, and, and leverage the research with some brood stock uh, to generate operating capital. And China's a, a huge market for shrimp. It's very interesting. Uh, about five or six years ago, China was a major shrimp exporter of sh farmed shrimp. In 2012, they became a net importer of shrimp. And this, of course, has to do with the rapid rise of the middle class, a lot of expendable cash, uh, an insatiable appetite for shrimp, and more increasingly, an awareness of food security issues, and and the, through through social media and these microblogs in China, they're having a community conversation about food security, food safety issues. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, they couldn't do that. 
And so the element of food security has taken uh, a, a front place in the mind of a lot of Chinese who, who can afford high quality seafood. So we were approached by a uh, private sector company in China. Meaning Oceanic. Oceanic. To help them uh, understand and develop a shrimp breeding program for their company. This was a shrimp processing company. They were finding that getting raw material for their processing plants was getting increasingly more difficult. Um, and so they want, in, in, a, in, a, in a, what I think is a progressive long-term view, they wanted to be self-sufficient in producing the raw material for their processing plants. And to do that, they felt they needed to establish a, a shrimp breeding program analogous to what we have at OI in China. So that's one opportunity. And so we're about, we're about six months into a, a, a multi-year contract with this processing company to, to train, to educate, and to conduct research field trials in China that help our breeding program here at OI as so well. So how does that work? You send over uh, researchers, um, <clears throat> and I suppose you deal with Chinese researchers. Right. And, Collaborate on the research. Time. That's right. How does it work? That's right. We we, we have uh, a, an in-country presence periodically throughout the year. It's not a permanent presence. We are fortunate to have some uh, native-speaking Chinese on staff that participate and serve as translators here 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 on staff. Uh, right, uh, and so they play a very valuable function in in communication. Uh, I've I found over the years that uh, that uh, the animals are the least of your problems. It's humans and the art of communication among humans becomes <laughs> the biggest obstacle to progress and moving forward. So communication is absolutely key uh, and essential. Um, but so so that that relationship seems to be working quite well. Uh, we just signed another contract with another Chinese company. Uh, in the same province, Guangdong province, as the shrimp breeding company, and they're interested in our shrimp grow-out technology. And this is a technology where we can grow large volumes of shrimp in a very small space indoors re using recirculated water. And you're doing that now in China? Well, we ju we're, just, we're just starting. We just signed the contract um, two months ago. And so this is a technology that we've developed here at OI. We started this technology development in this area in 1998. Um, and we received some uh, competitive grants and some, some federal grants to support that research. And we're able to produce about 22 pounds of market size shrimp for every three foot by three foot square. That's a lot of shrimp in a small area. And the real hallmark to this system is that you're not tied to the coast because you're reusing the salt water, and you're not tied to equatorial regions, warm water, warm uh, weather regions, because you do this indoors and you can control the temperature. So theoretically, we could put an indoor shrimp factory in Beijing and sell live shrimp to uh, a market and get a good niche price for it. Um, technologically, we can do that. We're still working on the econ you know, production efficiencies and the economies, but uh, this group we're working with in China um, is, is, is very interested in this technology, and we're going to work with them to try and troubleshoot and get, get this industry going. Well, uh, let me just uh, take a break to announce uh, what we're doing here. <laughs> sure. This is uh, ThinkTech, and we're talking about technology, but we're also talking about Asia because of what you guys are doing. And uh, this is Sean Moss, and, and he is with Oceanic Institute. He's the acting president of Oceanic Institute and the CEO for scientific programs there at Oceanic Institute. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so Sean, I mean, this, this t sounds terrific. I mean, this is high-tech aquaculture. Yes. On land, it almost sounds like a, a, what do you call, aquaponics on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it is. It's, and it, it is technology driven. It's not farm driven. And as we work forward with this company, that's, a, that's an important message to get to translate to them. Because right now, the staff we'll be working with are largely shrimp, traditional shrimp farm oriented. This is a completely different beast. There's a, there is an a absolute science component to what we do. There's actually uh, very much an art to what we do, uh, but it's, it's high tech. You have to use 
selectively bred animals that are disease free. You've got to understand the microbial ecology of these systems. You have to understand engineering aspects of the system. So absolutely, it's not simply digging a hole in the ground, filling it with water, throwing shrimp in there, and then occasionally adding feed. You're at the frontier for sure. Yeah. But uh, so it sounds like you're, you're going to build a facility to do this very high tech, super efficient you know, growing process with, right. the, with the brood stock. Um, and you're going to do that in China. But query, are you doing it here? Or is that the first incident in China? We would love to do it locally. There are a few indoor farms actually on the U.S. mainland. A colleague of mine uh, has a small farm in Michigan, believe it or not. Michigan. So he's producing uh, the same shrimp that we grow here in Michigan, albeit at a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and he he claims to be making money. He's been doing it for a while. Um, but uh, it's, it's something we would like to see done here in Hawaii. It's something we would like to see on the U.S. mainland. Right now, I think the production costs aren't where they need to be. I think construction costs are a lot cheaper in China. It's, it's elect electricity. Um, um, it requires a lot of electricity, so an elect electricity here in Hawaii, of course, is very expensive. That's another mitigating factor to seeing it done here. Um, so so there, the there's price some... of shrimp increases, and, and certainly in, yeah. in a world where food is, is going into shortage. Right. Yeah. Uh, and shrimp is in such high demand everywhere right. anyway. Right. It's not just a Chinese menu. It's no, that's right. everybody's menu. That's right. Shrimp have, has been, it's a, it's a product, I hate to say product, it's really an animal, that has been, you know, uh, uh, improved yeah, that's over right. time. And that's the taste right. is great and right. the cooking possibilities are great. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> as time goes by, these costs are going to seem small yeah. compared to the benefit. No, I, I agree. You know. I agree. I, I'll never, f in 2006, I, let, let me give you a little context for this. I, I grew up on the East Coast with six brothers and sisters, and we never ate shrimp. It was just, it was just something we didn't eat, and we ate a lot of can canned tuna fish. That was our sure. seafood, right? That with was the our, mercury, right? That's right. So a lot of canned tuna, very little shrimp. In 2006, shrimp became the number one consumed seafood in the United States, usurping canned tuna, and this has to do with the farmed, the the, the explosion of farm shrimp and how production costs dropped significantly where, where it, it became the most consumed seafood in the U.S. Are, are you saying that it was not the most consumed seafood before that because it was too expensive? Too expensive. What about my theory about how it's been improved so the taste is better than it used to be and the size and the appeal, you know, the way it looks, the way, the way it crunches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you could go down to Little Village here in Chinatown and have shrimp that will change your life. Yeah. <laughs> a religious experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's... I, and I think that it, the U.S. consumers become more health conscious and they're looking for alternatives to beef. That may have played a part of it, but I think a big part, and we, we've seen this with Atlantic salmon. Again, growing up, we rarely ate salmon. Most of it was wild caught and most of it was very expensive. The Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry exploded and production costs came way down. A lot of the Atlantic salmon we eat now actually are produced in Chile. Uh, the big really, industry really of Atlantic really. salmon in Chile, and it's because of uh, breeding technology, production technology, better feed and nutrition for the animal. And so now you can go to Costco and buy filleted Atlantic salmon pretty cheaply. This is a controlled environment. This Contro is not yeah. hunted salmon. This right. is salmon in, a, in an aquaculture facility. It is. They're they're net pens, so they're they are actually out in in, in the in the ocean. ocean, or, ocean or, but ocean. but it's 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 a much more controlled environment, and and the selective breeding I think has played a huge role in production efficiencies. People with complain about the sal salmon, though. They, you know, you have environmentalists who oppose sure. that. They say that the salmon is, um, uh, it's got problems of yeah. one kind or another. I right. guess, uh, and and um, you know, is that is that being dealt with? I mean, are the, are the salmon is the salmon that I buy today at Costco or otherwise? You know, is it going to be a a pure salmon, or is it going to have uh, bacterial issues? Or the bacterial issues won't be any different than probably wild caught. I, I think um, any any human activity has environmental impact, so you, you'll get you'll get complaints uh, from from some, no matter what you do. 
Um, I think the, the aquaculture industry as a whole has come a long way in terms of sustainability, mitigating impact to the environment. Um, uh, I, I think some of the arguments in the salmon industry and the shrimp farming industry even 20, 30 years ago, are, they're old arguments. They don't, don't hold water anymore. And I think the industry as a whole, because in part the consumer's demanding it, sure. is becoming more sustainable and, and producing a very healthy product. So I don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. You'll be fine. I'm, I love seafood. No, no, I, I encourage you to eat it. And it's a, it's a far healthier alternative than other terrestrial animal products. Yes, for sure. A different place on the food chain, for sure. Absolutely. So uh, let's talk more about, um, you know, the, 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 the techniques, you know, that you're researching and creating in the China Project. Because uh, make me an entrepreneur, a Hawaii entrepreneur, and let me worry about how I'm going to pencil it out, you know, buying what could be expensive uh, materials and getting what could be expensive land and all that. Right. But let's assume that I can put that together, that I have, uh, say, a market which will pay me enough so that it pencils out in terms of my investment. Um, what do I need to do exactly? to make this work. Aquaculture is never easy, you know? No, it's and never easy. you do easy. have to be a marine biologist <laughs> to figure it out. <laughs> well, I think, I think part of the problem with aquaculture historically is marine biologists have tried to do business, with, which they're not very good at at times, and businessmen have tried to do aquaculture and not have the marine science back. It's clearly a multidisciplinary technical uh, endeavor, so it requires uh, skill sets from a diversity of fields. But one, one of the things we're doing at OI right now, which is extremely exciting, not only globally and perhaps in China, but locally, is looking at wa agriculture waste streams here in Hawaii, whether it's from the biofuels industry, the ag industry, the fishing industry, and converting waste products into a high-value feed ingredient. The biggest obstacle to aquaculture and I would say animal production here in Hawaii in general, whether it's chickens, pigs, uh, poultry, is the cost of importing feed from the mainland. If we can produce... Well, what, is, what is the feed? So just so I can visualize The feed, this. well, for shrimp feed, it, they're small pellets. They look like chicken feed. So they're small pellets that contain protein. a protein source, a, a lipid source, a carbohydrate source, vitamins and, and minerals. And you have any number of possibilities for that. It isn't limited to one one kind of protein only. No, that's right. You can seek it here, there, the, as that's long right. as it... As long as it has the sufficient elements of protein. Right, and not all proteins are created equal. Uh, it's actually when you really start to study the nutrition of an organism, you really start to ask what amino acids do they need? Amino acids, of course, are the building blocks of proteins. So knowing just the protein content in and of itself is not adequate enough information to make a value judgment about the nutritional quality of that feed for that particular organism. Organisms have different amino acid requirements, different fatty acid requirements. But what we're doing is we're, start, we're, we're evaluating locally available ingredients and we're trying to formulate these ingredients into a pelleted feed for a, a fish. We, we work a lot with moi, uh, Pacific Threadfin, which is a, a, a fish that's widely prized here uh, in Hawaii. Is that's moi? Moi, right. And, and that's also grown in open ocean aquaculture, isn't it, Moy? That's right. It was. We, when uh, there was a... Randy Cates Randy was Cates, involved in right, that, that's yeah. right. So all of his uh, fingerlings came from, all of his baby fish came from OI at the time. There's several other commercial entities that are uh, either working on that or, or looking forward to investing in more Moy so culture So his company's here. not doing it anymore? No, no. I think it was Hukilau, I don't think is... is yeah. Steve no, Case was involved yes, in that. Yes, that's right. They had a little argument of some kind. Uh, that I don't know about them. Okay, well, sure. <laughs> we, we don't have to discuss that. <laughs> but but uh, I just, uh, you know, it, it strikes me that we, we have made, we made some progress on right. that, but then it's not happening. Right, right. And, and so you guys, again, it goes to my proposition that you are the mainstay, well, you know, you are the survivor, you are the one that keep on plugging, no. and you are the ones who are, you know, at the, 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 the core Right. of Hawaii aquaculture. You keep on doing it. Well, I, I appreciate those comments. I think we feel our charge is to solve the tech, technology hurdles that can assist commercial enterprise. There's, you know, we're, we're not engaged in the financing piece. We're not engaged in the permitting piece. What we do and what we will continue to do 
is identify with input from industry what are the technical obstacles for making this cost efficient and try and solve those problems. So you're helping me. I'm the entrepreneur, you're helping me. Are you, you going to charge me, send me a bill, or is it free? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. I think, I think we can negotiate on how this quid pro quo works. So you're getting intellectual property rights on what you do? You're getting um, patents? Uh, no, we were, we're basic, well, when we were receiving federal funding, our mission was to generate know-how, to generate te technological information, and to get that into the public sector. And how did we do that? We did that through peer-reviewed publications, uh, publications in industry, gray literature, through conferences. Um, so, so that was really, a, it was, it was a, a condition of the federal awards that we received, was to make the information available to the public. And we, we have, a, I'm proud to say, a very, a very good uh, track record in peer-reviewed so, publications. Altruistically, I mean, you, you did that as a matter of your mission, to try to help, sure. help people that's uh, right. You do aquaculture that's in right. Hawaii and elsewhere. That's right. That's that's noble. That's right. Um, so is that still the case? I mean, I, I, it, will you charge me now? Um, yes and no. I mean, we 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 to the extent we can, we will provide workshops where you would. We just had a uh, several months ago a workshop uh, where we brought out um, folks from the affiliated U.S. islands in the, in the Pacific, uh, Saipan, Palau, and we provided. Uh, essentially a free fish workshop that was funded through USDA uh, Center for Tropical and Subtropical Aquaculture but that the know-how that we gathered uh, through this workshop we disseminated uh, to, to the stakeholders of interest that that's an important mission of ours um, we have two beautiful buildings at the Waimanalo end of our campus one of which the com uh, construction was recently completed we're gonna have a ribbon cutting ceremony in August oh, good so you're doing construction that's great well we just we just finished and oh, so great. and so, so the, I remember there was a pier Mackay pier, Mackay they pier it. that's right and then you drove out on this uh, sort of concrete pier and then there right. was this big research building yeah that was all there was us well, for a long time. no, we've expanded quite a bit. You've, okay. We, we got to get you out there. Amber, no, yeah. <laughs> get us. Come on out. But we've got now two very beautiful, uh, well-equipped facilities. One is essentially cl classrooms and computers. The other is for laboratory learning, and and these were funded by EDA, uh, Economic Development Administration. Locally, uh, we have a very strong supporter with Gail Fujita, who sure. supported I was just us. Sure, mention that. Great. She is EDA. Yeah, she? she's <laughs> she's been such a great supporter of ours and provided uh, funding for these facilities. And our charge really is to fill them, fill all of the seats up there, and tra train a job for workforce. Um, but aside from the cost of training, and I and I'm. I understand perfectly that training should cost something yeah. so, because it costs you to put it on. That's right. But uh, beyond that, I mean, the actual content, uh, you're not charging for that. No. That's wonderful. No, no, no. That is, that is what they call a mitzvah. <laughs> you know? I'll, I'll trust you on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a yeah, good yeah. deed. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. It, well, it's part of our. That's that's an important part of our mission. I mean, our part, our mission, uh, really is to is to do the research, to develop the know-how, to train and educate people on how to use the know-how, and then to help tra transfer it. But at the, at the end of the day, we're a business like everybody else. Um, we will, to the extent we can, um, provide as much know-how as we can. Um, at cost, but at the end of the day, we are we are a business. Mm -hmm, sure, we have to stay alive. Yeah, um, and I, I guess I'd like to talk about that. But but first, I still want to pursue my idea as an entrepreneur, because I think there isn't enough aquaculture in this state. No, we have the perfect place for yes, it, and we yet do. we we have not achieved that destiny. Um, and you guys are offering this invaluable know-how right. uh, to anyone who cares, anybody who wants to do it. So make me an investor and believe that I can raise some money uh, or make me an entrepreneur and I believe that I have an investor who can help me with some money. And I come and I want to do what you're doing or trying to do in China, Guan, Guan, Guangdong, province? Guangdong province. Okay. okay. Um, what exactly is it that I need to do? What materials do I have? Uh, to you know, where do I go? Oh, and the and the fish pellets, you know, and all that. Right. Uh, and I guess my sub question is, why in the world can't we do fish pellets right here? Well, th let let me talk about the, f the the feed first because that's such a bottleneck. Yeah. If we can produce locally available feeds, and not only for aquatic 
organisms, but terrestrial organisms. We'll be able to become far more self-sufficient in food than we currently are. We, we import, uh, the statistic I heard was about 85% of the food we eat in Hawaii is imported. That costs, so we're shipping out over $3 billion a year to bring food in, in, in cash. Um, it's like the oil thing. You know, we make ourselves dependent when we don't yeah. need to be dependent. Right. We could do renewable energy, we wouldn't be dependent, right. we, and the money would stay here. That's right. And likewise, agri agri agriculture and, and agriculture. agriculture. That's right. You know, it's, if I go to another, another conference where they tell me that local ag agriculture and aquaculture is a good thing, I, I don't know what I'm going to say <laughs> because it's all talk. It's all talk in part because of the feed issue. And we, we uh, We've had some really good discussions with Ulupono Initiative, who I'm sure you're familiar with. No, I'm sure they're, they're, they're following They're closely. dedicated to local food security, and they've got a great organization and some great individuals within that organization with whom we've dialogued. And they're very interested in, in this issue of low-cost feeds produced locally. And so um, in, a, in a broader context, we received uh, federal funding a number of years ago to build a commercial prototype feed mill in Hilo. And we got real good state support um, with matching funds, some private foundation funds, and Ulupono's very interested in this. And the idea is, in fact, we're starting the design on this right now, groundbreaking we, we think will be next year, to build this commercial prototype feed mill in, in Hilo on some UH Hilo property. And, the, and the, the goal of this feed mill is to use local byproducts, as I was saying before, byproducts from the biofuels industry, byproducts from the ag industry, fish fish offal, the, the, the waste from filleting mm -hmm. fish, and to use those as raw ingredients to formulate feeds for chickens, pigs, cattle, moi, shrimp, opihi, abalone, whatever it is. Anything. Anything. Yeah. And to make a, a cheap feed so that we don't have to import. The, do you believe we can do this here? I do. I do believe it. If feed can represent in an aquaculture context about 60% of the operating costs. Yeah. So if we can reduce feed costs by not having to ship it in, yeah. all of a sudden... And, and all the oil and all that to ship it in, yeah. it's heavy. Yeah. All of a sudden, commercial aquaculture, commercial ter animal agriculture, they start to look far more attractive than they do currently. So what do I have? To, okay, I'm going to shift. I'm, thank you for that. I'm going to, I'm going to shift my entrepreneurial laser-like focus, okay, from actually doing the aquaculture and growing the animals to creating the feed. Right. Um, how do I do that? So I get some land, but what do I do on the land exactly? I have to grow other animals and use the protein from the other animals. Or, or plants, preferably plants, really. Sure. Right. So, so we need, we need a, a, a predictable supply of high-quality ingredients to go in. And, and those are going to be byproducts. So those could be, uh, we've looked at things like uh, kukui nut and, and coffee waste and papaya waste. Yes. And, and this is your research. This yeah, is the this kind is of the, thing. Exactly. This is exquisitely valuable. Exactly. You could change the world with this. Well, we'll start with Hawaii. We'll, <laughs> yeah, we'd like sure. to change Hawaii. For, so, so we're looking at the ag industries uh, and other industries, and we're saying, what are you guys throwing away? We analyze it for its nutritional content. We figure out whether it can be used for Moyan shrimp right now. And when we get the Hilo feed mill up, we'll be asking questions about chickens, cattle, and, and, uh, and uh, pigs with hopefully UH UH involvement, HPU involvement. We want this to be much broader community uh, than just just OI. Sure. Uh, and and then start to produce and start to test the feeds on a commercial scale. And all we need is two or three formulations that work. And by work, I mean the target species performs well on that feed, yeah, yeah. where we don't have to import well, the feed. How, anymore. how do you find that out? So you have to make a little bit. Right. So and, this and feed then you mill have to test it. Exactly. So this feed mill is, is an intermediate step between the very small feed mill we have at OI, which only can produce research quantities of feed, and a commercial, full-scale commercial feed mill. This is that critical intermittent step where you start to ask economy of scale issues. And if we can, and so we'll be able with the Hilo feed mill to produce commercial, small commercial quantities to do commercial scale testing, not just one or two fish in an aquarium, but an entire net pen. 
And, and that's when you start to get the investors interested. Investors are going to they're going to be a little interested in a benchtop laboratory trial. They're going to be a lot more interested when they go out and see the scale of these trials and the feed working on that scale. Then you get their attention. Then, then investors can make prudent decisions. Well, maybe this is a good, good time for us to segue into money. <clears throat> I mean, because I'm really getting excited from what you're saying. I mean, this is... This is core stuff to the future of sustainability. A in it absolutely is. It's hugely important. Otherwise, we're going to be relegated to importing. Send and, away billions of dollars, yeah. which we don't have to send away. And, and it's more than just the economic issue. Think about what happens in Hawaii if our ports get disrupted, whether we're at war, whether there's a tsunami, whether there's a strike. We've got, and I don't know if this is a true number, but I've heard a 12, around a 12-day food supply here in Hawaii. So except the, for McDonald's, except you know for, the old story. <laughs> McDonald's has like a 60-day supply, <laughs> well, but it can only you know handle their existing traffic. So the 60-day supply gets to be a you know a much yeah, smaller no, that's supply. Right. <laughs> our house cats. We start to look at our house cats in a different light. I think. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> but 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 it's. I mean, it's 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 disconcerting to speculate worst-case scenarios where our ports, for whatever reason, are disrupted. We're, we're going to be out of food. In, if it's not 12 days, it's maybe 24 and days. All the toilet paper you can hoard won't help a bit. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, so there's an imperative ab above and beyond the economic issue as to why we need to get more sustainable with our food. I think it's it's it, it's it's our longevity. I mean, can we, you can we hurry? I mean, yeah. <laughs> can you do this quicker? I mean, I really think this is core. Because, it is core. I mean, I, I'm, I'm friendly with Bill Spencer, and Bill Spencer runs, uh, I don't know if you know this, yeah. but he runs something called Hawaii Oceanic Technology, which uh, has a, a lease from DLNR for a substantial amount of ocean, ocean, open ocean land right, off right, Kona. Right. And, um, you know, he wants to grow ahi there. Right. And he's got the technology. He's right. just got to get it all started. Right. But, you know, he's the first one. Uh, and I mean, I, nobody else is growing ahi, and uh, some of the other stuff there is is, is is minimalist. And so we've got to have a whole industry here, and you guys are really in the center of yeah. making that possible. Well, it's it it's there's a lot of obstacles. There are clearly technology obstacles, and those are the kinds of issues OI can address. But there's permitting issues, there's environmental uh, issues that, and and an environmental voice out there that. Um, for, for very noble reasons, um, um, can can serve as an obstacle. Noble, but ill-informed, I would say. Well, I, I think we've got to. It's incumbent upon both sides of the fence, I think, to create a much better dialogue because the, the rationale is clear and unequivocal. We have to be more uh, self-sustainable uh, in terms of our food supply. Um, it's you know we have to do it. In, in, an, in a sustainable with a sustainable approach, um, but I guess that definition may vary from stakeholder to stakeholder. But but there there's a number of of impediments. But despite the impediments, I think we, we've got to continue to invest in these initiatives, and we've got to solve the technology problems, the permitting problems, the environmental problems, or or we're gonna we're gonna suffer well, we a fate do we don't we don't want. That's or right. continue to suffer a fate, yeah. you know, of losing all this money That's necessarily. Right. Not only that, but what you're describing is a really classy career, a career of, yeah. of, of raising animals, of feeding people, yeah. of doing, you know, technology yeah. in, of the highest order and being unique in the world. Yeah. Yeah. To do leadership, you know, global leadership, we yeah. can do it right here. And it's, it's right out there, low-hanging fruit. Yeah. And for some reason, we get all stuck about it. Yeah, no, that's uh, right. Well, it's... it's the, it's the nobility of the mission at OI that keeps the people there. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 not only one of the most beautiful places in the world to work at Makapuu, facing the, Molokai, oh, well, if, and the Rabbit see, Island right there, and it's it's. And you can see, uh, can't you see uh, Lanai or? Uh, Around or, the bend, you can see Mol Molokai. Mount, yeah. Mount, oh yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. yeah that's yeah. right. No, it's a, it, but but. The people at OI, I think, are they are, the, are by far the most precious resource. They're dedicated, passionate, bright people who are who buy into this cause, who are passionate about aquatic food production, who are passionate about food security, and uh, and uh, it really it really um, makes OI the success that it is. And yeah. so I'm proud to proud to work with them. Well, so let's talk about money. 
for a while. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, you know, we, this could be a quick conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I hope that some of your research is funded by HPU as your affiliate. Uh, but beyond that, you know, it seems to me that uh, this is a very important activity, and you ought to be flush with funding. <laughs> and I'm wondering if this does the state support you? Does the legislature believe in you? Does the yeah. legislature give you some money? Right. Uh, the state is very supportive of us. They're very supportive of the the feed mill in particular, and they've they've been more than kind in their in their contribution, financial contributions, mm -hmm. and just moral support and and and, and every which way. Um, but in all honesty, it's a tough landscape, right? We're 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 a fairly expensive place to operate. There's a lot of pumps and, and filters and electrical costs. Um, research is never cheap. Research is not cheap, um, and uh, so the so the landscape is 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 challenging. But we think through a combination of of sources of funding, we'll we'll, we'll be fine. We'll we'll persevere. I think what what we're experiencing right now is we used to have with the federal earmarks virtually all of our eggs in a single basket, and in hindsight, we probably should have better prepared for. Uh, diversifying our economic portfolio, if you will. Um, we were fortunate in that we created technologies that had market value and we're leveraging those technologies now. But um, but we, we clearly moving forward will not only have to get more clever in how we fund our research through grants, through contracts, through foundations, through donations, but another area that we haven't I don't think adequately exploited at OI is the training and education piece. We have so much potential to train locally, domestically, regionally, and internationally at mm -hmm. OI. We've got such beautiful facilities. We've got a lot of smart people who know how to how to how to teach others in, in how to use various pieces of equipment or water quality chemistry or larval fish rearing. Uh, that that's certainly a niche that I think we can fulfill better, and that that'll generate some some operating capital. Well, I, I hope so. You know what they say, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, nevertheless, uh, I, I worry because I don't think the public and, and sort of whatever the public feels, it's sort of, it's perceived by and it affects the thinking of the government. The government is really a, a function of public opinion. And um, I don't think the public really, uh, maybe after this discussion well, and, so. our, and our streaming, our live streaming of what you're saying, maybe it'll change. Well, I hope Tomorrow so. you'll get calls. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> you know, that, that reminds me of a funny story. For many, many years, um, we, we, we were reticent to open our facility up to the public because of biosecurity issues. So yeah. we, we can't afford the introduction and spread of any kind of pathogen. Sure. Two, I think it was two years ago, we, we, we decided to have an open house where we, on one Saturday, we were going to open it up to the public and we, we had demonst live demonstrations and a whole bunch of things. And we were hoping for several hundred people to come. We had no idea because we had never done it before. Well, to make, make a long story short, we were overwhelmed with, with visitors. Several thousand people showed up on a Saturday. What did you put out into the media? We, it wasn't a lot of publicity. We put up some posters, sent some uh, emails out. I, I don't think there was anything in the newspaper or on TV. Um, but by word of mouth and through some advertising, we were overwhelmed with the response. And, and, and I, I walked around and mingled with some of the visitors and, and the common comment was, we've driven by you guys for 10 years, 20 years, we never knew what you're doing. You guys are doing incredible things here. And, and all we saw were the porpoises in Sea Life Park. Yeah, yeah that's you know, right. Yeah, Untold right. generations passing by Sea <laughs> Life right. Park, not knowing what's across the exactly, street, essentially. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, you know, I, I guess I would, I would direct uh, my, my last uh, part of the discussion here to what's the future. Yeah. Um, because you guys, you know, it seems to me that you're positioned in a great place, mm -hmm. um, but you, you have these challenges that, mm -hmm. that stand in the way of realizing a vision that people have been having for 50 years for Hawaii being a leader in this area. And um, it's been, you know, in, in large part lip service and, and maybe some entrepreneurs who tried and failed. Uh, but right now, you know, you can't say that there's any particular facility in the state that is really... Well, they got they got the um, what do you call it the those um, they got in Nelha, right? What's that little abalone? Abalone. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think that's 
Yeah. That's probably the biggest production facility in the state yeah. right there. Yeah. Those guys are incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, They're testing one of our feeds right now. Is that now. right? Yeah, they, oh, uh, very they good. have to import their feed from South Africa. You talk about shipping costs. And so I think they're, they're very interested in uh, trying to get a locally available feed. But I visited that facility, fantastic facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have too. In fact, yeah. I made a movie over there. Oh, oh. And there's a South African woman, you know, who, who makes it sound easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she runs this whole big operation. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, to me, that's that's the goal to have lots of facilities yeah, like no, that agree. producing all kinds of seafood, and, you know, a diverse array of seafood that we here in Hawaii would love. Right. That people would, you know, can you imagine people coming and having seafood tours? You know, seafood tourism, right. a new kind of That's right. No, I think you know? <laughs> that would be a great sell, absolutely. And not only just seafood, the, another program I haven't mentioned yet that we're doing at OI is a marine ornamental program. So um, It's a we, world market for that. There's a, it's a huge market. Tell the people what an ornamental is. A marine ornamental is, is for the aquarium trade. So you're raising marine fish, marine crustaceans for the aquarium trade. And we've done some cutting edge research with yellow tang at OI. I don't know if you're familiar with nice the yellow tang. It's fish with the wavy lines. Beautiful, bright yellow. Yeah. And it's a huge export product out of Hawaii. But unfortunately, they're all wild caught to the tune of over 300, 400,000 per year. And that may not be a sustainable practice. Um, they take it off the reef. It's not They so take good. it off the reef. Yeah. And so. Uh, our finfish program at OI has has done some groundbreaking work to be able to um, propagate this in captivity. Not propagate, not complete the life cycle yet. We still have some technical hurdles, but to to get it past a critical larval stage. And so right now we have several hundred clownfish at OI, the Nemo clownfish that we're <laughs> we're, we're providing to local schools. Uh, and so the marine ornamental program becomes a very important conservation piece and can also turn into a bit a business for sure. the right entrepreneur. Sure. So it's not only it's food and it's a aquaculture is a conservation tool and uh, and we we hope we're going to be around here 50 years from now uh, talking about aquaculture in, in a different context perhaps but yeah we should have aquariums everywhere in yeah, Hawaii that, that should be part of our thing that we have this huge diversity and we actually are able to grow it in a friendly environment oh, that would be fantastic. and they should survive yeah. you know there was a fellow um, I don't know if you ever knew him by the name of Richard Massey mm -hmm. uh, Richard Massey yeah. had some degree in marine biology I think another from, marine so, biology yeah. yeah and he tried that yeah, that's and he right. had some land at uh, Campbell I think right. Yeah. And um, yep. it didn't work out. I yeah. think he was having trouble with investment and, yeah. and, and production. But it was a great idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. And, it's a great uh, idea. It's the same thing. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's as popular as fish food tourism. No, that's right. But we could make a brand over it, yeah. you know? Yeah. People think that it's all grass skirts. Oh no! <laughs> That's right. You know this is a high tech. You know, the, yeah. yeah. There's an outfit at Nelha that they're growing uh, seahorses that does quite well, and they actually uh, generate some of their operating capital by bringing tourists in. And and tourists are fascinated. People in general are fascinated with this. And they'd be willing to pay a pretty penny to see the hows and whys of marine ornamental culture. It's a, people are just in, really intrigued with it, and it's a, it's another opportunity. I like the aqu aqua tourism. Um, yeah, uh, well, slant. Yeah, you know, you idea. should live a long life. You should be happy. <laughs> you know, oceanic should continue well, and, and thrive, that. and the, the government should the government should recognize <laughs> its value. I Thank mean, you. this is a this is a destiny we have been you know yearning for, yeah. but not actually realizing for 50 years anyway. Well, I appreciate that. I think that. this is Hawaii's future. You're I right agree. in the middle of Hawaii's future, Sean. Yeah. Well, I, 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 it's been a wonderful ride, and, and I, I, I hope it goes on for another 100 years. But it's been, it's been a great ride, and, and we're doing great things, and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, I hope so, too. Thank you. And I'd like to come out with my camera sometime and do Anytime. a little movie and, what, you know, and sort of drill down on what you're doing out there. Anytime. You're always welcome. Thank you, Sean. Great. Thanks. Sean Thanks, Jake. Oceanic Institute. Appreciate Great it. Great discussion. Thank you.